Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Chief Technology Officer of Amazon, Dr. Werner Vogels. Wow, this is amazing. Good morning, New York. Oh, no, I know it's not such a good morning. You know, I know the World Cup, Argentina, Holland, things like that. Anyone who mentions Argentina and penalties to me today, I will unleash a whole bunch of chaos monkeys on you. Yeah? <laughs> not going to happen. Um, so, really proud to be here today in New York. Yeah, if you um, remember, I don't know if you saw it before, the hashtag for today on Twitter is AWS Summit. Um, if you want to complain to me directly, I'm Werner. I'm on Twitter and email will be Werner at Amazon. Um, this is our biggest event here in New York so far. Well over 10,000 people registered. And there's thousands of people on the uh, live stream watching. So this is, this is pretty amazing. Um, but in reality, I'm just the glue. I'm just the guy that talks pieces together. Because today we will have four customers that have been willing to actually come on stage and talk about how they are using AWS. And there's some really spectacular presentations in, in that. Um, and we'll also have some other, uh, how shall I say, surprises for, for, for you. So please stick around. Uh, first, I want to go back in time a little bit. This was a slide that Gardner put up on one of their uh, major events in Florida already five, six years ago. And Gardner, at that moment, had already realized that there was a massive mismatch between, let's say, internet-style companies who were moving really, really fast and enterprises who clearly were still stuck in sort of these yearly cycles of product development. And they were warning already at that moment that, that these younger businesses might start to eclipse enterprises really fast if enterprises wouldn't become more agile. And the reality today, a number of years later, is that some of the true household names today are these young internet companies, no longer these enterprises. Yeah, hotels, it's Airbnb. Music is dominated by Spotify and similar streaming services. Uh, Dropbox definitely um, dominates storage today. And there's a whole range of these young businesses that are really successful in moving much faster and really meeting customer needs by focusing on them. Why? Because most of these, or actually all of these, definitely these examples, all these young businesses no longer have to worry about IT. They're all focused on building better products for their customers. And so let's actually take Airbnb as an example. I don't know if you guys know Airbnb. Um, I definitely here in New York State a number of times in a room brokered by Airbnb. So this brokerage service between people that actually have rooms or houses or apartments to offer on a night basis uh, and people that actually want to use them. Each night, about 150,000 people are spending a night in an Airbnb brokered room. Any hotel chain would kill for these numbers. Yeah? And actually, they're pretty lean. But if you see how they've, how they've grown over time, at the beginning of last year, they've had 4 million customers. And about now, they've had well over 15 million people spend the night in an Airbnb room. And to support that with their infrastructure, they're actually pretty lean. They've grown over time. Um, but there are now about around 1,300 EC2 instances to support their, their business. If you ask these guys, why, why are you using AWS? They have a very clear answer. We only have a five people IT operations team. This is the whole IT organization. These guys keep thousands of servers in the air, uh, they have many, many tens of terabytes of storage and everybody else in the organization works on building a better product. And so for them, agility is key because it allows them to focus on what really matters for their business. Now, it's not just, of course, the young businesses in hospitality that are making use of cloud. Actually, 
quite a few of the established players as well. Uh, Four Seasons, as well as Intercontinental Hotel Group, make use of AWS um, to support much of their digital properties. But even a very established, very old guard hotel chain like Kapinski has actually made radical decisions. Kapinski is, is in the high-end luxury hotel chain business. They're building new hotels in China and Middle East. And they realize that in the high-end hotel business, digital services to customers are going to be the differentiator between those hotels. Because they're all luxury, they're all beautiful, but really the additional services that you're going to deliver to your customers matter. So Kapinski had made a very radical decision to move all of their IT into AWS. So this is a hotel chain worldwide, properties worldwide, where all those properties, all their IT, all their ERP systems, everything will be running in AWS. And so here, on one hand, you have the young businesses, the Airbnbs that run on, on, on AWS. You have the high-end hotels that run on AWS. And then in the middle, sits this large, small, and boutique hotel business that actually now is being served by companies like Hotel Logic and SiteMinder, who provide software as a service, property management so software as a service of high-end enterprise quality, but delivers it to small and boutique hotels so that they get integrated into uh, engines like Kayak and others. And so here you have basically the whole hospitality suite, yeah, from small rooms all the way up to high-end hotels and small and boutique hotels, all making use of AWS services one way or another. And so it is really uh, interesting to see that agility now becomes the big buzzword. Every organization we talk to talks, asks us, please help us become more agile. And of course, the basis of that is a very agile resource model. But first you have to look at why, why is this agility such a problem? We have to take a step back and look at that there are actually just bigger economic challenges happening that drives these new resource models. Yeah, there's an abundance uh, of products in the market, there's increasing competition, um, there is increasing power of consumer to choose exactly what they want, and also a decreasing brand loyalty. Yeah, where maybe 10 years ago, you were absolutely certain that you would sell the next generation of your product to exactly the same customers that you sold the previous generation to. That's no longer the case. That guarantee is out of the window. And we combine that with a lack of capital. Now, there is great uncertainty in the market whether or not your products are going to be successful or not. And in a world with limited capital, you need new resource models to be able to deal with uncertainty. With uncertainty yeah? You have to acquire resources on demand, you release them if you no longer need them, only pay for uh, what you've used and use all those core competencies. And actually, these are principles that have nothing to do with IT by itself. These are actually principles that we apply in every other part of our business, and we've been doing that forever. For example, also with human resources. You, know, you, would, you would hire more people if you need them. You may release them if you no longer need them. You hire particularly core competencies if you need them. And so in every other part of our organization, we have these very flexible resource models already, except in IT. And so the success of cloud and AWS is mostly driven because we're giving you a resource model that falls exactly into place what the economy needs and what businesses need right now, instead of that is just the next technology step. If, if cloud would be the next step of technology, you know, from mainframe to mini to client server, web, and now cloud, this wouldn't be this big. It is the impact that it has on businesses on the ability to actually innovate and move faster that actually drives the success of cloud. This is a great quote from Joe Ito. Um, he's the director of the Media Lab, and he says, if you want to increase innovation, you have to lower the cost of failure. And if there's something that we really try to achieve with AWS, is that it's easier for you to actually be agile and to move faster with developing new, your new products. And actually, so, but don't take my word for it. Um, I would like to introduce Andreas Heidt to you. He's the Senior Director of Cloud and Application of Siemens, a very traditional enterprise. And he will talk to you about how AWS has helped them become more agile. Andreas. Good morning, everyone. 
I'm coming to you from Siemens Healthcare Diagnostics, where our mission is to advance human health through innovation. And we're serving customers in diagnostics labs, in hospital labs, in physician offices, with products such as lab analyzer machines, corresponding diagnostics tests, and intelligent software to automate workflows in those labs. And we're touching 800 million lives every year with 9 billion of these diagnostics tests. So that clearly makes us one of the leaders in that space. So now that you know why I'm here, uh, now that you know where I'm from, let me tell you why I'm here. Well, first of all, I would like to share an uncomfortable truth just to get your attention this morning. And then I would like to talk about what Siemens is doing to make that truth a little less uncomfortable. And then, of course, I would like to talk about how AWS is enabling us to deliver on that. So here's the uncomfortable truth. Statistically, one out of three people will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. And even worse, if you are diagnosed, the treatment options available to you are often ineffective. And that is because many times a certain type of cancer has subtypes where one subtype is not exactly like the other. So a treatment might work for one subtype but not for the other one. And so that makes the treatment options sometimes like a draw of luck. And we at Siemens want to do something about that. And that's why we started a precision medicine program through companion diagnostics with our partners in the pharma industry, Pfizer and Janssen, just to name two of them. And in a nutshell, this companion diagnostics program will deliver diagnostics tests that can identify these subtypes of illnesses. And then we can provide that information to the caretaker. Now, why is that important? because the caretaker can take that information and create really a personalized, customized treatment plan for you as the patient with that. And that should ultimately lead, of course, to improved outcome for you. Now, what many of these companion diagnostics tests have in common, they require large data analysis. And of course, you do that with software. And we at Siemens Diagnostics build a platform for that, and we build that in AWS. Now, this is a simplified depiction of that platform, and the scope is really end-to-end. -end. It starts in the lab with uh, order creation uh, through some automation of the workflow there. But then it gets really interesting once the raw data comes off the lab machine and gets transferred into the cloud automatically. And there, it's get, getting stored in a secure way. But, and automatically, the appropriate analytics application then kicks in and analyzes that raw data. And out of it, it creates the result set that we're looking for. And then the platform takes that result set and merges it with the confidential patient data that we also have in the platform, stores it securely, and enables the caretaker to get to it in an easy and secure way. Now, I want to point out this is a platform. That means we can imagine a, a load of different application types that we can run on this, all analytics applications, of course. But they will have a few things in common. They're going to be secure, they're going to be highly automated, and they're going to be scalable. And of course, we're using AWS services to make that happen. So let's talk about security first, because that is the most important topic for us in the healthcare industry. When we looked at AWS, we had two criteria in mind. First, we wanted to make sure that AWS can deliver the features and the innovations around security that we need to meet our requirements. And then the second criteria, we quite frankly wanted to know that AWS knows what they're doing when they're running their data center. Can they run them in a controlled way? Are they secure, et cetera, et cetera. And I can tell you that both of those criteria are fully met. Uh, there's so much innovation going on specifically around security, and I'm just going to mention one recent cloud trail. We use that to track activity in our infrastructure, and we use many other of those services. That together with the industry standard certifications and independent audits that AWS was able to provide to us, such as SOC audits, uh, ISO 2701 certifications, made us really comfortable and confident, actually. 
And on top of it, for the healthcare sector, they came up with a business associate agreement program that really then gave us the confidence that we can build secure and compliant applications that conform to the HIPAA standard, which is really, for in healthcare, the most important for us. So let's talk about scalability. Why is that even important for us? Well, lab workloads can be spiky. And we want to offer a service to our customers where the cost to our customers tightly mirrors their usage. And so we're using, uh, again, many of the platform services for that. Just to name two, we use auto-scaling groups. And we also recently moved to managed database service, RDS. And why we do that is simple, because we can then enable our customers to be agile and make decisions about how large the workloads they want to run, how small they might be, many, uh, many, few, and the cost of the usage will tightly reflect that. So we're really making them agile to make these decisions. But agility is also about AWS making us agile at Siemens, because we use platform services for things that we simply don't want to worry about. So for instance, monitoring our infrastructure. Or uh, I'm picking CloudFormation as an example, where we run our stack creation automatically in dev test production, and we do this with two resources. But really what also makes a huge difference when you work with AWS is the people. The AWS support team, the enterprise architecture team that help us virtually on a daily basis, figuring out tough technical problems that we ourselves could not figure out, at least not at that speed. And the fact that we have global infrastructure, global data centers, allow us to be agile in responding to our customers when they come to us and want a regional implementation. And that is totally possible because of regulatory requirements. And last but not least, the continuous price reductions that we've seen with AWS give me personally ag agility, because I can allow my team to try out new things, experiment, and still remain within my budget because all the other things that I had budgeted for got so much cheaper. And so I don't have to walk down the hall to see my CFO and beg for more money, and that is really agility for me. So to summarize, we're confident we can build secure and compliant applications with AWS. They make us agile, and we love it. They do this at a price point that is probably not met in the industry by anybody else. And yet, you get a scalable and global infrastructure, the best that money can buy today. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any interest in learning more or collaborate with us on this platform, please contact me. Thank you very much. Amazing. Uh, great story. Um, also, I think about the ability to move faster. Now, if you look at agility, I think uh, there's sort of three basic steps in if you want to be more agile in building new products. Yeah, on one hand, you have to experiment continuously. And experiment sounds a bit scary, but I really mean you have an idea and you want to put it in front of your customers and then work with your customers to see whether that's something that they like and actually then drive the product in the direction where it can actually be successful. I think that's sort of the blueprint for new agile businesses. So on one hand, there is you have to be able to experiment continuously. Yeah, you have to be able to measure relentlessly, exactly knowing how are my customers using my products, uh, what do they like, what is it that they not like, get these feedback cycles going. And then the first step in this always is to learn from those numbers. Yeah, on one hand, you can drive it to maybe amplify a number of features or services that you have in your application. Or you know, maybe you have to pivot. Maybe you have to take a different direction if it turns out that your customers are actually not really using your products in the way that you have uh, envisioned it. And so, that piece in the middle there, measure relentlessly, is extremely important. And probably also one of the hardest pieces in everything. Yeah, if you look at all the A-B testing and things like that, many different variables, making decisions based on that is hard. Yeah, and first and foremost, you actually have to be able to get to the right metrics and the right numbers. 
And on one hand, you know, there's the infrastructure pieces, the, your CPU, your number of nodes, your storage, all those kind of metrics. And on the other hand, you have the application and sort of the operational logs. And I've always been a, a, a very big uh, proponent of storing as much information in logs as possible, including um, timing and, and, and uh, performance information. Um, there's a number of really great slide decks done by the guys from Etsy. Um, go to SlideShare, look for them. Uh, they have a whole set of great patterns about how to monitor large-scale environments using logs and what kind of information to put in logs and how to process them. Yeah, but so on one end, there is the metric stuff that you can get through CloudWatch. Yeah? But on the other hand, there's all this application log stuff that is around that you also absolutely need to process to get a good view of how your business is actually performing. And it's hard. You know, if we're, most of these files are large and complex. There's many different formats. Um, you may have them laying around of all the different instances. And remember that if you use AWS, you often treat your instances as fungible. You know, you start, you stop them, and you still have to make sure that all that information that sits on all the different nodes that you have actually gets to this one place where you can process them. And so this is a very error-prone process. And I like to believe, you know, log, log collection and processing is an absolutely painful experience at the moment. We're going to solve that for you. Yeah? I'd like to introduce to you logs for CloudWatch. This is the ability to have all the loss that you have at all the different instances, to move them to one centralized place, have these logs being analyzed, have metrics being served out of it, put alarms on it, and even be able to auto-scale based on them. Yeah? So this is something that you have a very small uh, agent that you have to run in your notes, and we will take care of moving your log file data to that one particular place. And we use actually Amazon Kinesis for, for this. Yeah? It's really millions of records a second will flow into Kinesis. Kinesis replicates this automatically to three different availability zones, make sure that all the data in those log files are processed in a timely manner or near real time, and then will allow you to manipulate that through the CloudWatch interface to set your alarms or to process those log, log files or to actually just to archive them and keep them around for a long time. And I like to believe that this will help many of you in a very simple manner to actually get the log files and the information about your application into one place and process it there. And the first five gigs both in terms of ingestion as well as archiving, um, is for free each month. And after that, it's a very simple pricing model based on the amount of data that you actually process. And so cloud logs for CloudWatch will really help you serve um, that information about your, your applications uh, to you much easier and simpler and integrate that into the other tools that you use, such as Autoscape. So this brings us, if you look at sort of the whole breadth of services that we've delivered, remember eight years ago, we started just with storage and security and access control. Yeah, pretty quickly we added compute and VPC and networking to that. And then we added a whole range of say supporting services. On one hand, there's managed databases and whether we have RDS, and whether we have uh, caching, or, you know, we'll give you, we have DynamoDB there for you as a key value store, or as a NoSQL store, actually, because there's much more that you can do these days with DynamoDB than just key value. Um, there's the whole range of very exciting analytic tools. Yeah, on one end, there's Elastic MapReduce, and we'll have Kinesis for input, and we'll have uh, the data pipelines. And on the other hand, you also have their Redshift, the data warehouse. Amazon Redshift is the fastest growing AWS service ever. The interest in analytics, in getting a data warehouse at your fingertips, where you can just instantiate it for a few hours and run a thousand node data warehouse 
for just two hours on a Friday afternoon is extremely powerful. We next to that, we have, of course, all the app services um, to be able to glue things together. And then the whole set of deployment and management interfaces. Yeah, and so this is a collection of services that is ever growing. And it is actually you that helps us define what those services are and what the features are that are in those services. I just mentioned Redshift. Redshift, since the beginning of last year, has launched well over 60 new major features and services based on your feedback. And so this collaboration between our customers and ours and our inventive powers creates this epic collaboration that creates a whole series of services that does exactly what you want us, what you want those services to, to do. And if you look at the sort of the speed of innovation that we have, you know, last year we launched well over 280 new major features and services, and this year at the end of June, we were already well over 200 for this year. Yeah, and I want to just touch on two uh, launches that we did recently that you may, may or may not be aware of, but I think that are pretty significant. We are already, with all of our EC2 instances, on our second generation there. But we added a T2 instance type that allows you to get good baseline performance, but also be able to capable to actually burst if you periodically need more capabilities. And this is a very, very interesting uh, model with CPU credits that you build up over time that you can use to burst. It's a very interesting model. And it's also our lowest cost instance type. EBS, general purpose, uh, SSD instance um, uh, volume types have now become standard. And again, this gives you perfect, consistent performance with at the same time the ability to burst all the way up to 3,000 IAPs. Of course, you know, still we have EBS with provisioned IAPs still available to you, so if you really need to run this high-end database applications, you can, you can configure that still to run with 48,000 IAPs, if that's what you want. But for standard operation, the default now is this SSD-based backends for EBS. I think those are really uh, significant changes for our customers to get much better consistent performance. So this whole set of services actually brings also a whole set of new customers to our platform. Those that want to make use of all of those services to build their IT organization on. And I'd like to, uh, like to invite Joe Simon on stage. He's the Executive Vice President and CTO of Condé Nast, who has a very interesting surprise for you as well on video. So, Joe, with that, please come and tell us how are you are using all of our AWS services. Warner, thanks for having me over, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so before I get started, a quick word about who Gandhi Nast is. We're a pretty old company. Um, we're a media company that's known for producing the highest quality lifestyle content. We have 18 consumer brands uh, that ranges from servicing everything from uh, focus, uh, brands focused on entertainment and culture like Vanity Fair, technology focused brand like Wired, and fashion centered brands like Vogue and GQ. Uh, basically, we have something for everyone. So, so one of, we are the cool guys today in this presentation, I guess. So our job as the technology group within Condé Nast uh, is to provide the content makers at our company with the best tools to create content. <laughs> and as you can see from this, we're not just a print company, or we were a print company, but now most of our content is distributed across all sorts of places. So we got to ensure that the, we have the platform and technology flexibility to enable this content to be distributed wherever our editors want them to be. And of course, we also continue to manage the traditional IT functions like HR and finance and sales. We got to do that to make money, you know, keep track of things. So as we move down this digital path, everything from creation through distribution, 
we started looking at our operations and seeing what we should be and shouldn't be in. So one of the questions we asked ourselves was, do we really want to be in the business of running data centers anymore? Uh, many of you here can attest, owning and running a data center is a whole business in itself, well, like AWS. Uh, and ha even having an in-house data center doesn't provide us with the agility and flexibility that we needed as we went down this digital path. So we decided the best option for us is really moving to a cloud solution. Uh, as with a medium-sized company like ours, it has and a company that's 100 years old, uh, we have complexity as anybody else does. Lots of servers, petabytes of data, a uh, bunch of networking. Well, we had to get all this done. And because of the time frames we had, we needed to really get this done in about a three month time frame, the actual implementation. Uh, we looked at a whole bunch of cloud providers. Amazon is one of them. Um, we looked at capabilities, functionality, flexibility, and of course, cost. And we ended up balancing all of these that made sense for us. From every aspect, Amazon topped the competition, strategically, technically, financially, and they provided us what we need to grow. Uh, we, want, we want a dynamic environment that adjusts as we want to adjust and grow and shrink as we want. Um, capabilities that extend not just for content creation but beyond that, and this migration gives us that flexibility. <laughs> and of course, the added benefit is we get a fairly decent cost saving we'll be down about 40% in an operating cost with our move to Amazon. We now have a platform that gives us the speed and tools to distribute our content in today's uh, fast-paced environment. And we can also adapt as we need, especially as we grow down the digital side. Now, the migration is now complete. About three months, maybe a little bit more than three months. Um, and one of the things I wanted to show you is, when you have a, now that you migrated, our data center is empty. And you all know what happens with empty data centers. Things grow in it. Uh, so here's a look at what my crack staff did last week. So this move to Amazon Web Services really positions us well for the future. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Uh, amazing video, eh? I mean, some people really get excited about hugging servers. I, I really love it when those lights go out. Yeah. Actually, so one of the things that Joe also mentioned um, was how um, it drives their cost down. And so I want to uh, bring back something um, that you may have seen from us before. So I'm a strong believer, or actually at Amazon, we're strong believers in building what's called flywheels. Now, flywheels are things that will keep your business in motion forever if you do it the right way. And so this more or less starts with sort of if we can increase the AWS usage. And on one hand, it is, of course, because we have lots of customers. But on the other hand, also, it's a large ecosystem. There's a whole range of more services available. And the more usage we get of AWS means we have to buy more infrastructure. It means that we get better economies of scale. 
that means that we get a lower cost structure. Yeah, and on one hand, that's not just because of the uh, economies of scale, it's also because we put a lot of effort into um, innovating in data center efficiencies. So we've then taken the chart that if we get a lower cost structure, we will actually give you money back. Yeah? We will reduce our pricing. That's our commitment to you. And of course, reducing pricing brings more customers onto the platform, which creates more AWS usage. And so here, you have this flywheel going, because this will keep itself going forever, drive, driven by the fact that economies of scale and our infrastructure innovation can actually drive our cost base down. So we've lowered our pricing now 44 times yeah, without any competitive pressure. And we'll continue to do that. Not only that, we actually help you reduce your bill with AWS. And we do that uh, with AWS Trusted Advisor, which is a tool that you can use on your infrastructure and it will give you advice. It will give you advice around security, it will give you advice around reliability, but also around cost. Yeah, and so we've given out well over uh, 1.7 million recommendations by now, and customers that have followed up on those recommendations have saved well over $300 million with us. Yeah? We are happy to help you drive your bill with AWS down. We're in this for the long haul. Yeah, for us, this is a high volume, low margin business, and for us, it's really important to help you become successful. And driving your costs down with AWS is an important part of that particular picture. And so I'd like to uh, introduce Saman Michael Farr on stage. He's a senior vice president of technology of FINRA, and he will talk about how our cost strategy has helped them become successful. Well, good morning. So I'm Samuel Michael Farr from the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our projects and our use of AWS as it relates. And I think it's interesting hearing the speakers before talk about it and sort of this convergent evolution that seems to be happening in different businesses. So what do we do? Let's start with that. Essentially, I mean, in the nutshell, is we receive feeds of market events from exchanges in the US and firms. We get 30 billion of these market events and we create a picture of what's going on in financial markets. And then run an extensive library of surveillances that we have on these to essentially look for hanky-panky going on in the markets. There's all sorts of patterns. You know, we look for the sun and the moon and the stars over here aligned. A butterfly flaps its wings over there. There's something in the data. There's something going on here. And, deserves investigation. So what are the issues around this? Well, when you've got this kind of volume, there's certain things that come up. I think many of you are familiar with processing at scale, and it's very different from processing not at scale. What happens is market volumes are typically very volatile. A typical you know, normal trading volumes are there's many factors of difference between a slow market day and a high market day. That's one aspect that makes this challenging. Then financial markets are not static. There's a lot of innovation going on to attract capital, new products, new rules introduced around these. And in the middle of all of this, the market manipulators also innovate. So we need to be very agile and nimble to be able to track with these things as they, alt as they change and evolve to bring new surveillances to market and new capabilities to, to bear to look for all of these things that are happening. So what does this mean? For us, we're in the midst of a project to move all these operations to AWS. Here's the way it works. You'll see on the left there, those are the various sources that provide us with that 30 billions worth of market events that come in. On the right-hand side, we have dynamic clusters that spin up, and these are running our surveillance libraries on them. And we use technologies like Hadoop, SQL, Hive, uh, HBase, other NoSQL technologies. Um, the, 
EMR extensively. And what happens is these clusters come up, they'll do processing, they'll kick off alerts, the alerts go to analysts who look at them, and then they'll do follow-up and interactive queries to explore around what's going on around certain events that have come up. So within this context, in the middle, what we're building is the data management system that will create, what it does is, what we do is we create a picture of the market at every moment and update these as the moments continue and new data arrives. And when new data arrives, we, it may change a moment in the past. So for example, uh, 10.02 a.m. today, the picture is this, but at 3 p.m. information might arrive that alters that and updates that picture. So we'll keep this coherent and consistent, and we keep this information for years and run analytics on it. So you know, that middle section has data versioning of uh, lineage tracking, all sorts of aspects that are required for this to work at scale. So when we were looking for a platform to build this on, so that, to run our surveillances on, on, what we did is we looked around a lot. And why, why, why do we choose AWS? I think that is of interest. One of them is that the level of functionality is at the right layer for us. We have significant amount of software developers and technologists here in New York and outside of Washington, D.C. And what we want to be able to do is innovate and develop our systems on top of this to match to our business. And the APIs and the functionality providers gives us this ability without necessarily needing to get under the hood into the infrastructure, but having that visibility to be able to do that and tune if necessary. It's very important for us not to get bogged in there, put our dollars where our business value is, but be able to have full generality of control on what's going on. The second is the automated infrastructure deployment. That's a critical for us to operate efficiently at scale. And what we get from AWS is that ability. And then the, other, the last one, which is important, is we're a big data processor. As you know, the big data market for solutions is very fragmented, it's evolving, it's a new area, the winners aren't clearly established. For us to avoid vendor lock-in, we need to be on open source. We need to use it, we need to be part of the ecosystem and contribute back to it. And AWS's strategic commitment to that fell in line with our objectives. Then the enterprise operations and security provided by AWS clearly set up for enterprise support from systems engineers that were assigned to us that we work with, the, the level of support we get, the security facilities with very stringent requirements on sec security that are satisfied. What are we getting out of this? Agility, respond quickly to our business needs, put our money where the business value is in terms of software development. Speed, production application we have at the moment. For example, one of the systems in production a typical complex query that was executed a lot was taking an hour, hour and a half, now five to 10 seconds, and cost savings. Hardware use at scale and paying for what we use with the elasticity, we're projecting to save 10 to 20, 10 to 20 million annually around this. The, what's next? Complete this project, it's a two year effort. We're going to production and every couple of months we're releasing parts to production and changing our development culture, the mentality of developers to be able to exploit really the ability to have dynamic computing, spinning up clusters, solving business problems in a different way. I think we can offer a lot more value in terms of that. That's a culture shift for developers who are used to being locked into the capacity that they can utilize. I think with this is the basis of what we're doing and the, what we feel is a transformative capacity for our surveillance abilities. Thank you very much. Thanks. Actually, there's a, there's a story I've heard more often. Um, when customers move from their own um, data centers or from their own in-premise environment into AWS. I often hear from customers that the security posture actually improves when you move into the cloud. It's because we're giving you these very great tools, but we also force you to use them. 
We lock down everything when we start things up. And you have to make explicit decisions exactly what to open up and how to protect your applications. I, I think that um, it's fun to look back at sort of the, uh, um, the mission statement that AWS started with. Yeah, this was our original mission statement, to help developers and businesses build sophisticated, scalable applications. And I think, you know, over time I've become really proud at what I have seen, what our customers are doing with our, uh, with our services. Yeah. And if you look at sort of the most successful applications in those world, they're sort of cloud native. And I think cloud native applications have a few very specific properties. On one hand, they're really automated. The ability to make use of auto scaling, to be elastic, and to be able to be elastic not just because an engineer turns up a knob, but in an automated way, such that you can have business rules that decide how to scale your application up and down. For example, one of those metrics could be latency towards the customer. Yeah? And so, as such, you can have business rules that determine how your application is going to scale up and down. It also allows you to build them in a cost-aware manner. What I mean by that is if you decompose your system into the right building blocks, you can make sure that your application actually grows and shrinks over the dimension where you are actually going to make money. And so, for example, uh, in, in Amazon, the retailer, that dimension might be number of orders a minute. Yeah, if that number goes up, the cost of the infrastructure might go up as well. Hopefully not as fast as that, you know, your business metrics grow. But if you build your systems in such a way that they are aware of cost, you have total control over it. Quite a few of our customers are making use of all the regions in the world. Yeah, and actually some of them are very, very advanced in that. Um, one I'd like to call out is a company called AdRoll. They do this ad retargeting. And so they need to bid for ad space in under 100 milliseconds. So they make massive use of DynamoDB. They do tens of thousands of writes a second. And actually they replicate DynamoDB over four different regions around the world. So they can have low latency access to any of those regions when they want to target advertisement in any place in the world. They definitely compose and orchestrated such that you can do your DevOps and you can actually manage them easily. And very importantly, cloud native applications make use of encryption wherever they can. And, and I'd like to actually take up an example. This is the, uh, this is the Financial Times. They have a number of um, very high quality data feeds coming in um, and they actually want to make sure that all of those data feeds are totally protected. So they encrypt everything. They encrypt it while they move it into AWS. Uh, they do some ETL transformations on it. They store it, encrypt it into S3. They then move it into Redshift where it is also encrypted. And as such they have total control over exactly who has access to data under which conditions. And actually, even if you're under the covers, we do at Amazon more or less the same. Redshift is a great example. For example, we make use of VPC to totally protect your Redshift cluster from outside access. And only the main node where you communicate with sits in a VPC that you share with, um, with the Redshift cluster. And as such, everything is protected at the network level. But not only there, we actually default encrypt each and every one of the data blocks in Redshift. So you have these one megabyte data blocks, we generate a random key, we encrypt it with it, and then that set of random keys that we have created for each of those data blocks get encrypted with a master key. In general, that's a key that we generate for you, but if we make sure that all those data blocks in storage are encrypted. You, however, can also bring your private key here. If you store your private key in the cloud to HSM device, we will use that key to encrypt that set of uh, master block key, uh, that set of block keys. And as such, you have total control suddenly over who has access to your data. Because all the keys are encrypted with your own private key in the cloud HSM device. So if you look at uh, this set of applications, this set of sort of 
properties, we see a whole range of very interesting cloud-native applications arriving. I'd like to uh, invite Steve Litster uh, on uh, stage, who's the global head of scientific computing of Novartis, who's going to talk about their cloud-native use um, of their applications. Thank you and good morning. Um, today I'm going to give a brief overview of how Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research are using AWS and scalable infrastructure to accelerate scientific research. So although this work was completed in 2013, I think it still makes a very compelling story because it's fundamentally changing the way we are approaching our research computing at NIBA. So NIBA is the research division of Novartis Pharmaceuticals. We have seven campuses worldwide, specializing in a number of disease areas, including oncology, ophthalmology, respiratory diseases, to name a few. Our purpose is to cure and care, and provide medicines that treat and prevent diseases, ease suffering, and improve the quality of life. So work at NIBA is exciting, it's incredibly rewarding, but it's not without its challenges. Each day we try, strive to create shorter development times produce safer treatments, and actually lower costs. And this is the reason why. The average length of time to take a drug to market is approximately 10 years at a cost of $1 billion. And these are actually probably underestimates right now. My group's role within NIBA is to help the scientists reduce these numbers. Um, these are absolutely staggering numbers, and we have to start to reduce them quickly. Now, the way we're doing this is through the application of high-performance computing to a number of scientific disciplines including next generation sequencing, imaging, and a variety of modeling and simulation techniques, one of which known as virtual screening, I'll briefly talk about now. So virtual screening is a computational technique used in drug discovery to search libraries of small molecules to see which have the ability or most likely to bind to a target, typically a protein receptor or enzyme. So think of it as a lock and key model, where the protein is the lock and the small molecules are the compounds of the keys. And basically you want to test tens of thousands of keys against the lock to see which may fit and which may have the ability to activate or deactivate the mechanism. So back in 2013, our colleagues in computational chemistry came to us with a request to dock 10 million compounds against the common target that had been identified in a number of cancer-related pathways. Now, this seems simple enough at first until we started to do the calculation, and we figured that in order to, to actually complete this work, we need sustained access to over 50,000 compute cores. Now, this was a bit of a problem, uh, as for one, we didn't have 50,000 compute cores internally, or the $40 million to build a cluster of this size. In addition to this, our internal HPC environment was 100% utilized, and our job pending times were already increasing exponentially. Um, we were absolutely dead in the water, we were stuck, and we didn't know what to do next. So we did, we contacted our friends over at Cycle Computing, Molsoft, and AWS to see if they could help design a system that could handle such a load. Uh, which also brought with it a whole bunch of other uh, requirements that I'll not go into now. But basically, we had to create a system that was fast, extremely secure, inexpensive, and easy to use. Quite a daunting task. Um, but the team rallied, and we're certainly up to it, and this is the architecture they came up with. Um, it really is a, it's quite a work of art. So our data and application stack was encrypted and securely uploaded to S3. This data was then used to populate local EBS volumes of spot instances as they were built and deployed across four availability zones, using the combination of Cycle Server and Chef. Now, given the embarrassingly parallel nature of our workflow, we were able to use Condor Job Schedule and Cycle Server to actually split and distribute the job across thousands of different instances, while at the same time retaining the ability to monitor the job progress and, more importantly, cost. It really was quite an elegant solution. So how did the experiment go? Honestly, I'd have to say it surpassed all expectations. It really is quite amazing. So we spun up 10,600 spot instances across four availability zones, which equates to about 87,000 compute cores. And we did this in the course of two hours, actually under two hours. We then proceeded to dock 10 million compounds in nine hours. So basically, we'd, ca we'd completed 39 years, or the equivalent of 39 years of computational chemistry in just under nine hours for a total cost of around $4,200. It really was amazing. 
And most importantly, we've actually identified three promising compounds out of that simulation. So the result were, the results certainly went through the organization pretty quickly. So as you can imagine, demand for services in this space has been going through, going through the roof. So in the last few months, we've been reworking our financial and operational models to be able to cope with these next generation workflows, especially in the space of imaging, genomic sequencing, and large scale analytics. All of which come with their own unique properties, problems, and challenges, especially when you ask the scientists to think big and what would you do with unlimited resources? Be very careful when you ask that question. Um, so now what we're dealing with, the, the millions of molecules or mili millions of compounds are now becoming billions of compounds. We're actually going to need a supercomputer to analyze the results when we start running this. Next generation sequencing is producing data faster, cheaper, and at a scale of an order of magnitude greater than the year before. We're now moving from tens of terabytes a year to hundreds of terabytes a year. And possibly one of the scariest and most disruptive technologies we've seen in almost a decade, known as live cell imaging, has the potential to produce 10 times the amount of data of next generation sequencing data. So we're actually looking at petabytes a year of this data. As you can tell, this is quite a challenge and it's quite a problem. The science is real and it's happening right now. So with that in mind, we've actually been reaching out and collaborating with AWS to see if we can actually retool, rebuild, and actually completely rethink the way our high-performance computing environment is set out globally. Because we really need to build a research computing platform that's able to cope with these new emerging technologies as they come through, the, as, as they come through in the science. Um, and on that note, I'd like to say thank you for listening. And hopefully, what I'm really hoping for is that by Amazon reInvent, we may be able to actually show some of these, these use cases that we're talking about right in terms of imaging and sequencing. So on that note, I'd like to say thank you uh, for your attention, and thank you for AWS for having me here today. Thank you. Um, amazing applications. Um, Actually, that whole world of, of um, sequencing is, is, a, is a definitely a world that is heating up tremendously. There's a story, um, so um, a company called Illumina, for example, makes these sequencing devices. Um, and these, this data spits out directly into Amazon S3. You don't even see the data anymore. And then you go into uh, Illumina's online um, analytics environment which is basically an interface to analytics uh, uh, algorithms running in EC2 to process the data for you. You don't even see the data anymore. You, you really sequence it, and you have all these analytics uh, available to you. And actually, Illumina even has a marketplace where if you have new algorithms that you want to operate on these sequencings, you can actually make them available through uh, Illumina's marketplace. It's very interesting. So coming back to this cloud-native world, um, just the last one that actually I didn't talk to you about yet. And so that is where I really see that uh, devices, tablets, uh, mobile, all of these are just windows into data and content and services that live in the cloud. Yeah, it is no longer the case that you load content onto your device. It actually appears automatically for you there. And no matter how many different devices you have, you can actually always access your content and your services from wherever you are. And this is an area that is expanding tremendously. For example, it isn't there yet, but I really want to get there. So it is, if I step in the morning on the treadmill in the hotel, yes, I do that sometimes, yeah. <laughs> um, I want this treadmill to automatically reconfigure itself and in, based on my identity, and immediately give me access to all my movies, my music, my, my newspaper subscriptions, uh, my business documents, all these things should be available there. And so all these devices, all these connected devices, are just a window to data and services that will live in the back end in the cloud. And that's definitely something that is heating up tremendously. Now, if you look at all the different um, mobile applications that are being built, or let's say device independent applications that are, that are being built that you can, can consume anywhere, is there's the mobile first revolution is absolutely here. 
And whether that is around content such as uh, the New York Times and Newsweek, or whether it is companies like Tata Motors, who have hundreds of thousands of trucks that they're instrumenting with all sorts of technology to be able to not only track where they are, but what the health of the truck is and whether they can do preventive maintenance on there. Or whether it's gaming. Many of the gaming uh, 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 games today being built are built for mobile first. Well, companies like Dropcam and Yelp and others are all available to you on any device that you like to use. Now, this building, these mobile first uh, applications, yeah, I have, have a number of sides to them. Eh? On one end, they have to be really feature rich. And the challenge then there is to actually make sure that you can synchronize the state that you have on these devices um, to any of the other devices, such that other devices can access them as well. And, and the challenge there, of course, that you have to have a solid idea about who is the customer and what is his online identity and, and how can they log in. And then you have these engaging apps, and we all know that you have to measure that. I mean, we talked about it before. You have to measure relentlessly if you want to build better applications for your customers. Well, you know, actually, measuring on the mobile devices is, uh, is not easy. It's a challenge. Yeah, and then you have a whole set of back-end services that you need to have be able to access to be able to build these engaging applications. And we have a number of very interesting announcements for you today. And for that, I would like to invite Marco Agenti on stage, who's the Vice President of AWS Mobile, who's going to talk to you about a whole range of very new, exciting mobile services. Good morning, everyone. When we talk to developers today, especially mobile developers, what we hear is that uh, their time is split. It's, it's split between uh, focusing on uh, their app design, on the business logic, focusing on uh, the things that really make their app uh, stand out and uh, really what their customers love. But that focus is balanced uh, by a larger amount of what we call un undifferentiated heavy lifting, like the muck of having to build and manage all the components that are needed to support applications that are becoming more and more sophisticated. And that's very important functionality, and it's often very hard to develop. Like it's functionality such as managing identity effectively across uh, multiple devices and multiple identity providers, supporting multiple devices and ensuring that the app experience and uh, the user experience is really seamless as customers move from device to device, Working offline or in case of intermittent network conditions, uh, that's something that is becoming more and more important as uh, users roam from device to device, from environment to environment. And allowing guest access uh, um, that, so that customers can personalize their app even before they log in, and so on and so, on and so forth. And really, this is the dream uh, for mobile developers, to be able to spend the majority of their time building features that are really making their app unique, building beautiful user interfaces and beautiful designs, creating smarter business logic, having new levels of playability for their game, or reaching deep, deeper engagement with their customer base. So today, with that goal in mind, we're introducing two new services in our mobile services, an improved mobile SDK, and also an updated uh, set of features for SNS, our mobile uh, push notification service. So let's start from the first one, what we call Amazon Cognito. Cognito helps uh, mobile developers build applications for a modern era of multiple devices where customers want access to the same data, to the same experience across multiple accounts on multiple devices, powered often by different mobile operating systems. And the challenge is that managing identities across devices or keeping data in sync is very difficult. There are lots of moving parts, and each time a developer has to do that, basically they end up reinventing the wheel. So Amazon Cognito is a fully managed user identity and data synchronization service that has three major components. 
identity, synchronization, and a set of robust security features. Those are features that allow you to sync user preferences, to ensure, for example, that your game state is consistent across devices, to securely access other AWS services from your mobile app, uh, even if uh, the user is not logged in. So offering really full-featured guest access. Let's talk uh, first uh, about uh, mobile identity. So Amazon Cognito allows a developer to manage unique identities and supporting multiple login providers, such as Facebook and Google, and, and logging with Amazon within their mobile application, and also enabling secure guest access. The second part is synchronization. And Amazon Cognito allows you to store app data, preferences, game state, and seamlessly sync that data across multiple devices. And what's more, it allows apps to continue working in case of in, in intermittent network conditions by creating a local store on the device that then can be synchronized uh, across devices when the device is actually back online. And about security, Cognito makes it really easy to implement security best practices for mobile developers. So they can keep your credentials off their mobile device and automatically manage sets of temporary unique credentials associated to every identity so that they can set granular permissions on all the AWS resources that can be accessed from, from a mobile device. So that's Amazon Cognito, our identity and, and data synchronization service. And how about analytics? So really, when we talk to developers, we hear that having fast and reliable engagement metrics once the app has been built and is out there have become a cornerstone for really building and, and continuously improving apps based on customer feedback. And it's really key to understand how your customers are using your app. And so with Amazon Mobile Analytics, we allow you to stay up to speed with what your customers are doing, how they are using your app. And all this with data that is fast is available within the hour. We offer out of the box automatic uh, calculation of monthly active users or daily active users of retention metrics, all things that are extremely important for mobile developers to really understand and have a pulse of their customer base. And also, we allow developers to create and design a custom events that they can associate to any event that happens in an app. For example, visiting a certain uh, uh, feature or, or, or clicking on a certain button, or for example, sharing the content, and so on and so forth. So that is really important to get the next level of visibility and granularity within an app. And of course, the data is not mined or sold by Amazon. It belongs to the developer. So that was Amazon Analytics, Mobile Analytics. It's a fast and reliable service for user engagement metrics uh, and reporting for mobile apps. And now let's take a look at the new improved uh, uh, mobile SDK and also all the service connectors that we're making available specifically for mobile use cases. So the AWS mobile SDK makes it really easy to add cloud functionality to your app with a collection of APIs that are tuned and optimized for mobile access. There are new service connectors that are tuned for mobile use. And of course, this SDK is available for iOS, for Android, and, and for Fire OS. It, it contains support for the services that were announced today, Amazon Cognito, Amazon Mobile Analytics, and a series of connectors like S3 Transfer Manager or Kinesis Recording for streaming data directly from the mobile device. S3 Transfer Manager takes care of uh, uh, handling upload and download and stop and start and resume all transparently from uh, the developer standpoint in case, for example, of intermittent network conditions. And of course, uh, integrates with mobile push notification and with other AWS services such as EC2, S3, CloudWatch, and so forth. So really, the mobile SDK is a path to working with those new services and building new applications on top of AWS services. And of course, you can still use Cognito and mobile analytics and all those components individually. But really, together, they form a really powerful platform for building mobile applications on phones, on tablets, on connected devices. 
We've also extended SNS Mobile Push. And SNS Mobile Push uh, is a highly scalable, low cost uh, mobile push notification service that allows individual customers to scale from a few messages to tens of millions or hundreds of millions of messages per day. And it works across multiple platforms. And it's really uh, something that uh, you know, allows you to reach a very, very broad number of customers around the world. And today we're announcing a new feature, which is message time to leave. It's very important for notifications to be timely. But then uh, you maybe in some cases you don't want to deliver them outside a certain time frame. That could be, for example, breaking news or so forth if the phone is off. And so that is available now today. And you know, we have great customers using SNS Mobile Push. We have, uh, for example, uh, uh, Mailbox and Secret and other levels that is uh, uh, managing uh, very popular games such as Jetpack, Joyride. They're all uh, really enjoying using SNS Mobile Push to reach their mobile customers. And so joining SNS Mobile Push today are a comprehensive set of new mobile services which are aimed to really dramatically improve mobile apps by letting designers and developers focus on the core elements that are differentiating for their apps and securing accessing AWS resources across multiple devices. And so let's take a quick look at pricing. So both uh, Amazon uh, Cognito and Mobile Analytics uh, are available uh, to all customers on a free tier, you get 10 gigabytes uh, each month for Cognito for free. You get a million sync operations. And always you get 100 million events every month for mobile analytics. And then after that, you know, we have a very, very simple pricing model. So all those services are available today. You can hear more about that. Uh, we have a breakout session today at 4.30. And of course, you can learn more at aws.amazon.com slash mobile. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. So, um, so let's revisit this slide. Yeah, there's now another vertical in there, which is mobile services, helping you to develop your applications in a mobile-first world. But there's actually more still to our, uh, to our breadth of services, and it sits really in the enterprise application space. So last year at reInvent, our big user conference in Las Vegas, we announced Workspaces. Now, Workspaces is a virtual desktop environment um, that truly delivers on the promise of that. Now, uh, when People asked us, why did you actually attack that problem? It is when we were talking to our enterprise customers, they were really giving us a clear message that virtual desktops were really, really hard to manage for them. Much hardware, never good enough performance, multiple data centers, managing it everywhere was very hard for them. And if you look at sort of what are the core competencies of AWS under the covers, it's to be able to work at performance, at scale, cost efficiently, secure, and reliable. And so those are really our core competencies. We know how to build systems like that. And so we take those core competencies and then apply our innovative powers to this particular problem set. And that became Amazon Workspaces. But there are many more, many more pain points in enterprise IT that the customers has asked us to innovate in. And so what is the next enterprise IT problem that AWS is solving? So we've been given feedback by our customers that document sharing and collaboration is one of the harder pieces in today's enterprise. It is often core to the enterprise. This is what often work centers around, to be able to easily share documents with your coworkers, and then operate on them. And so on one hand, there's the IT side of enterprise document storage and collaboration, because you want very strong controls, you want it to be absolutely secure, and you want to have very tight regulations around who can access what data, who, how can this data be shared, and things like that. And of course, it needs to be at a cost point that is really affordable for everyone to use. But on the other hand, your workers want ultimate flexibility. 
They want to be able to access their documents from any device. Uh, they don't want additional passwords. They want to be able to use your single sign-on enterprise logon to actually access their, their documents. And they need to have an environment where it's very simple and very easy to give feedback about the documents that you might be sharing with your coworkers. And you don't need all these tools to do complex version management and things like that. Much of our customers have given us feedback that the existing enterprise storage and collaboration tools are way too complex for them to use. So they resort often to doing this sort of collaboration over email, which is just a nightmare. And so with all of these requirements around you know, enterprise document storage and collaboration, I think there is a perfect fit again with sort of the AWS way of inventing new applications that can help you solve this problem. So with that, I would like to introduce to you Amazon Zocalo, which is a fully managed, secure document storage and sharing service for enterprises. Now you can easily... <laughs> I like it too. <laughs> Actually, this, this keynote, the whole uh, slide deck and things like that, um, we've worked, Matt Wood and, and others, and I have worked together on creating this, this whole presentation by using Zocalo as a feedback uh, tool for that. Worked perfectly fine. And so, on one hand, you want to easily share documents. Yeah, you want to be able to just point to documents that are on your Mac or on your PC, and you want to be automatically actually sync that into, uh, into Zocalo. And it needs to be integrated. It's integrated with your Active Directory, with your corporate directory. And you can set also to user sharing policies. And most importantly, for the IT side of things, there are audit, audit logs for every document access and every user activity. Yeah, there's a very simple mechanism uh, in there to actually look at all the different types of documents that you are sharing, and it's easy for you to give feedback on those documents. You can access it from any device. There will be native applications for, as well, iOS and Android and Fire. All of those, you'll be able to access the document storage and the feedback tools from anywhere. And of course, most importantly, it is secure and reliable. It is based on Amazon S3, which means that you get your, dur your 11 nines durability. We encrypt everything in transit as well as in rest. And for your IT managers, you have very flexible controls about exactly who can access what data. And most importantly, of course, you can choose what region you store your data in. And as always, we give you the guarantee that we will not move your content out of the region where you stored it in. Important, I think, of course, in this, in this context, is that you don't want additional passwords. You don't want additional things. You are, this is actually a true enterprise application, and as such, it integrates with the enterprise services that you already have. Yeah, it's integrated with Active Directory. You can use your existing credentials, and your administrators can set rules and authentication in the way that your enterprise actually determines. But why don't we just invite Paul Duffy on stage, who is uh, AWS from AWS Product Management, to give you a demo of Amazon Zocalo. Thanks, Vernon. Good morning. So it's my pleasure to be able to give you a demonstration today of Amazon Zocalo, our new enterprise storage and sharing service. Now, we're going to start the demo off with a login. That doesn't necessarily sound like the most compelling way to start a demonstration, but as you'll see as I show you the sign-in screen, one of the things that Werner talked about with Zocalo was the ability to integrate with existing directories. So end users can log in with the corporate credentials that they already have, which is good and convenient for them. That also gives the administrators the knowledge that they can make sure only authorized users in their directory can have access to the service. So I'll get started and sign in now.
So here we're starting off with what we think of as a kind of central document hub for all of your files, all of your various documents that you'd be working with. So I have a list of files and folders here. I can look at them in a couple of different ways. I can see previews of certain file types like Word documents, PowerPoint presentations, PDFs, spreadsheets, and other images. It's very easy for me to add files to Zocalo. There's a button here to add content. I can drag something with drag and drop. Or another important capability we have is the Zocalo Sync client. So I've got a, a Mac laptop here. I might have a Windows laptop as well, some desktop PCs. If I install the Zocalo Sync client, I can choose a folder that I want to have synchronized. So everything I put on my PC or my Mac is synchronized and securely stored in the Zocalo service, and vice versa, meaning that I get access to all of the data that I need across my devices. So when I open my Zocalo folder here, we can see it's exactly the same list as I have in Zocalo. The first thing I'm going to show you is how easy it is to share something with Zocalo. Now, in the past, maybe we'd have to switch to email, attach a file to an email, work out the email address of the person that we want to share with. Very simple with Zocalo. I'm going to choose this PowerPoint presentation to start with. So I get a nice preview of the presentation. Let's say I want to share it with some people, ask them to give me some comments. What I need to do is choose share, choose the colleagues that I want to share it with, ask them for feedback. Well, I can even give them a deadline for feedback. I'll be generous here. Once I've clicked OK to share it, Zocalo will send them an email automatically telling them that I'd like to get feedback from them and then remind them as I've set a deadline so they can give me feedback. Now, I'm not going to waste your time. Good. Well, we'll see even more features now. <laughs> now, I'm not going to make you wait, even though people like to work quickly at AWS. I'm not going to make you wait for those people to respond. Cooking show style, I'm going to show you one I prepared a little earlier. And the first one I'm going to do that with is this Word document. So it's a pretty simple Word document here. I can see the text and the graphics. On this Feedback tab, I can see comments from a bunch of people who give me overall feedback on the document, as well as giving me specific feedback on sections. So if I look at Aaron's feedback here, you can see when I look at his feedback, there's a little arrow showing me exactly in the document where he's given that feedback. I've got feedback from some other people. It's shown in different colors to make it easy for me to understand who the feedback has come from. Really easy for me to consolidate that. And I can download this Word document. I can download a copy of this document that has all of those comments embedded into the Word document. So for people who like working with comments in Word, it's really easy for them to carry on working with those things as they iterate on the documents. But Zocalo is not just about Word documents. I also want to show you another PowerPoint presentation I've been working on here about Amazon Workspaces, another service that we launched not too long ago. So one thing you can see at the top here this is telling me it's the sixth version of six. So Amazon Zocalo keeps a copy of every version of documents that you're working on, so you can keep track and iterate through different versions of the document. Werner and I know this from working on the, the content that we've been preparing for this conference. When I look at the feedback, the same kind of thing. This is the experience of people giving me feedback on different versions of a PowerPoint presentation, consolidates it for me, and they can give me that feedback on anywhere in there. And the last kind of um, file I'm going to show you where we've got some feedback here. Here, we, we sh I shared a web page with some people. I'll ask them to give me feedback. It happens to be our home page. Uh, and we've got some feedback there from our design team suggesting a few different things that we can do. So really, really easy for me to share files and get feedback from a bunch of different people, have all of the feedback consolidated into one place. It makes it really, really easy for me. Now, I talked about the concept of this being a kind of central hub. People could also share documents with me for me to give them feedback. So here, I can see on the left-hand side, I have something awaiting my feedback. My colleague Matt has sent me a file, so I can open up that file, and then I'll be able to have, to have a look through that file and provide him with that feedback. So just give it a second to load. And you can see on the right-hand side of this screen, I've also had some comments made by one of my colleagues already. So I can see what other people are saying about the document as I'm working on it. It's not this kind of, I have to email an attachment and wait for Aaron's comments. 
All of these things are centralized to help you iterate and help you improve documents as you work with them. So here we've got this presentation. We could go through a few slides of this. I could leave a quick overall comment, or I could just pick anything that I thought I liked in the presentation. Let's see, I like the pace of innovation that we've got here. So that's nice, give some feedback to Matt. Find something else, public sector, a lot of stuff. Not sure I like the font, change this. And then I can send that feedback back to Matt. And he will now get an email telling him I've given feedback. He'll be able to consolidate all of the feedback from all of the different people who are working on it. So really, really easy experience for both me as the person who's providing feedback and also the person who's receiving the feedback. Now, I'm using a laptop right now. That's not always the way it's going to be. Perhaps I'm mobile, and here I've got an iPad. So I want to show you what we've done with the iPad app for Zocalo as well. So what you'll see with this iPad screen here, it's the same kind of thing. I have the same folders that I had before. You could look at any of these graphics here. Even jaded New Yorkers like nothing like a cute dog to have uh, as a photo you would share. But I could also go to any of those files that I've looked at earlier. The first call deck that I shared before. I see the same kind of feedback from all the people that I worked with. I could look at the document that Matt had sent me earlier and show you what that experience is like on a mobile device. And when this document loads, I can look at it in the same way. The experience is optimized for a touch device, so I can use the gestures that you'd expect for zooming and so on. Now, the other thing is, this is not just viewing. If I wanted to leave a comment, I can just drag a region here, add a comment, bit more difficult to type on this. And the same kind of thing to send that feedback back to Matt, be a bit, a bit nicer this time. And he gets the same kind of experience in getting the notification from Zocalo telling him the comments are there. I also have the ability to mark files for offline use here. So they'll download them to the iPad. I can work on them offline, provide feedback online. And then when I reconnect, it will automatically sync those comments back up to the Zocalo service. I'm going to finish this demonstration off by going back to my laptop and just showing you a little about the experience for the administrator. So I'm going to quickly show you the Zocalo administration console. And this is where the administrator, administrator gets the control to do things like see how much storage their organization is using, invite other users, control settings users have for what they can share and where they might be able to share. And they also have the ability to see an audit log, an activity log of what's going on. So in this demonstration, we saw how simple it was for an end user to use the same credentials with integration with an existing Active Directory to get access to their files. We saw how this central document hub for sharing files, great for me as a reviewer, great for people who are reviewing content, that place to coordinate all of that kind of activity to keep my files in sync. We saw how seamless that experience was across different devices. And then we looked at the administrator experience and the controls that they have. Zocalo is available today in limited preview. We would love you to sign up and, and try the service out. Please enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you very much. Bye. It is, it is very exciting. Yeah, and actually, I'd like to, um, to come back to a piece earlier on in the presentation where we talked about cloud native application. And this is clearly a cloud native application where your devices, as Paul just demonstrated, are just a window over your content and services that live in the cloud. So Amazon Zocalo, easy sharing, simple uh, feedback on your documents, access from any device, integrates with your corporate directory, is encrypted both in transit as well as in REST, and it's at pretty low cost. So let's look at the pricing picture for Zocalo. Yeah, five dollar per user per gigabyte uh, per month for 200 gigabytes of storage. And there's a 30 day free trial for your organization to see whether you want to use this. Also, if you make use of Amazon Workspaces, you get Zocalo for free for 50 gigabytes a month per user. Yeah, so many of these applications really come well together. So with that, I hope that uh, next to the great customer stories, 
that we, uh, that, that we had on stage here today. I'm pretty sure that you will remember that video of the data center for sale. Yeah? Um, but but let's recap what we launched today. Loss for CloudWatch that allows you to bring your loss distributed over all of your different instances into one place for processing and storage. Amazon Zocalo, which gives you enterprise document storage and collaboration. And then the magnificent new mobile services that will really help you build mobile first applications. Yeah? Amazon Cognito, which gives you identity management as well as syncs uh, functionality. It's the mobile analytics, which that you can really, really determine and measure relentlessly how your customers are using your mobile applications. And, of course, the mobile SDK, which connects you to many of the different AWS backend services. So if you want to learn more about that, go to aws.amazon.com slash new. And with that, thank you all for being here today. Uh, there's some great content this afternoon, great services this afternoon. And thank you. See you next year. Thank you.